Houston Texans won the AFC South in 2015, but can they do it yet again in 2016? We're about to discuss it. You're watching the MJ Take on Sports Fan Entertainment. Sports Fan Entertainment, 32 teams, 32 days, and today we're talking about the Houston Texans, the 2015 AFC South champions, and there's been a lot of change for this football team, especially on the offensive side. We're about to get into it. We're going to look at their strengths, their weaknesses, go through their schedule, crank out a win-loss prediction, and we'll get the hell out of here for you. So... Let's start with their strengths. And I had a little bit of trouble with finding strengths for this football team. Because really, when you look at their team, they have certain positional groups where their strengths spattered around, but not just like one position group where top to bottom throughout, there are absolute good players every single position. Yeah, I mean, every single player at that certain position. So I had a little bit of trouble, but this is what I came up with. So number one, I went with the offensive line. And this is a little bit of a projection, but I think this will prove to be true. So you're talking about Dwayne. Dwayne Brown on one side, you're talking about Derek Newton on the other. Dwayne Brown continues to be one of the top left tackles in the league. Derek Newton continues to be one of the top right tackles in the league. That's a good duo. I like Jeff Allen, who used to be on the Kansas City Chiefs. I like him at right guard. Okay, that's good. The other two positions is a we'll see. Xavier Suafilo scheduled to start at left guard. He has been very impressive thus far, but they've been talking him up in training camp. We'll see whether or not that can register to the field. And then Nick Martin, the center slash guard who you drafted in this very draft, he should come in and play well. But, you know, we'll see. So two out of those five positions are a little bit of a question mark for me. But overall, I think it's a strong offensive line. I also went with the running backs. Lamar Miller, I actually believe, is one of the better running backs in the league. He's a guy that was very uh, underutilized when he played for the Miami Dolphins. I mean, consistently every week you'd be asking yourself, you'd be crying, you'd be yelling at your team. TV. Why are you guys not playing and giving carries to Lamar Miller? You need to give him 25 carries a game. I think the Houston Texans will do a better job of that. And behind him, they have Alfred Blue, who we know is capable in his own right. So the running backs, they're also good. From there, I actually included one more. This one, though, isn't completely perfect to me, but I went with the linebacking core as a whole. So outside linebackers, okay, we have Wendy Merciless on one side. He's really turned into a good NFL player. You have Jadavian Clowney, who when he's on the field, he's been very productive lately, but he needs to stay healthy and he needs to remain on the field. So that's a little bit of a question mark, but if he's healthy, he should be good. Inside linebacker, Bernardrick McKenney. This guy has been playing better lately. I think he's the best inside linebacker on this football team. And then right next to him, you have Brian Cushing, whose play has really diminished lately. Like I said, I think Bernardrick McKinney is better than Brian Cushing right now at this point. But Brian Cushing still offers those nice football IQ plays, those nice awareness plays where he knows where to be from time to time. So he can get away with that. So I like the linebackers. There are certain positions, though, I couldn't put in the strength category, but they have the potential to be strengths, like the defensive line. Now, J.J. Watt, he's great. He's fantastic. We know that. We get that. Okay, no problem there. Vince Warford, uh, Vince, Vince Wilfork, excuse me. We know that he's really good at stopping the run. The question is, I mean, this he's just not going to do it. He's not going to pass rush for you. Okay, he's not going to do it. He, it's too late for that. He's too old and he's too fat, and we get that. As long as he stuffs the run, that's great. But then who is going to come in and be another interior pass rusher? It doesn't exist on this football team to me right now and then in your other defensive end position Jeffrey Pagan Christian Covington who and who neither one of these guys inspires any confidence for me whatsoever so that's also a question for me so I couldn't put the defensive line there despite the heroics of JJ Watt on a game to game basis the wide receivers couldn't put it in the strength category yet. Okay, we know DeAndre Hopkins is great, but besides him, who really do we know we can rely upon yet? Jalen Strong has looked good in training camp. Everyone's saying, oh, he's lost weight. He looks good. Look out for Jalen Strong. Well, I have to see it because he really wasn't very impressive last year. And at Arizona State, he 
was kind of limited. So I haven't seen any potential from him yet. So until he actually puts it on the field, I can't really believe that. Cecil Shorts, really, really not even close to being the player he was for Jacksonville back when he was really dominant back there. He really needs to step up. I've been really disappointed with Cecil Shorts since coming in the league. And they were too because they drafted not one, but two wide receivers in this draft, Will Fuller and Braxton Miller. Now, I, I, I didn't get the Braxton Miller pick. I, I said this is a waste of a pick because he's going to be your fourth or maybe even fifth wide receiver. He's not going to see the field. Not only this year but for years to come because DeAndre Hopkins is young and you should keep him. Uh, Jalen Strong is young and you should keep him and Will Fuller is young and you should keep him. So I don't know why you're drafting another wide receiver. When will he see the field? They did it anyway. He's not going to play and then Will Fuller He's going to have to develop a little bit. He's not a sound, complete prospect quite yet, so I couldn't put the wide receivers in that strength category. Let's talk about some weaknesses. There are some on this football team. And first of all, it's the tight ends. CJ Fedorowicz, we keep talking about him. We keep talking about his physical profile. Oh, he's tall. He's strong. He doesn't do anything. They're saying that he looks good in training camp. He's looking better in the passing game. I haven't seen it, and neither have you. This is a guy that has not shown anything to me at the NFL level. He dropped a number of passes last year, including a touchdown catch. I remember that specifically in my head. Not a good player right now. Ryan Griffin, you know, they keep talking about him. I, I saw nothing from him to indicate that he's anything more than an average run-at-the-mill, blocking, in-line, maybe red zone, tight end. You know, nothing fascinating, interesting, eye-opening, nothing to intrigue you. Uh, just a very... Uh, blah, mediocre tight end. So I think the tight end position is a big weakness, and there's I don't think there's much hope for it. You know, CJ Fedorovic, I don't think he can play very well. I don't think he can play. I don't think the safeties are very good. You have Andre Hall at one of your safety positions right now, and you also have Quentin Demps. I mean, they're very okay. The good thing is, uh, really with Quentin Demps, he's really good in coverage. He's not great against the run. But when you have such a strong defensive line in terms of stopping the run, and in terms of the linebacking core, also in terms of stopping the run, you don't really, you really don't have to see that weakness a lot. You know, running backs won't usually get to Quentin Demps, but if they do, you'll see he's not a great open field tackler. And Andre Hall can make a little mistakes in terms of technique, in terms of being conservative on a certain tackle attempts and whatnot. So I don't love the safeties either. And honestly, I don't love the quarterback. And it's a little bit of a question, but I, I, I kind of had to put in the weakness category. You know, I don't think Brock Osweiler is very good. I thought they overpaid him. A guy that got paid four years, $72 million. He's going to well, deal with worse weapons here in Houston because for Denver, he had two wide receivers in Demarius Thomas and Emmanuel Sanders. Now he has one, and he has an assortment of guys that need to prove themselves. And he doesn't have a tight end either. Doesn't have, I mean, the defense is still really good to help carry him. He had, what, 10 touchdowns to six interceptions last season. Just looked like a game manager. Just looked like a guy that was just, you know, just trying to go through the motions, just trying to make safe, conservative plays. And if that's what you're looking for, he's going to give that to you. But I, I think we're talking about if you rank the 32 quarterbacks in the league, Brock Osweiler is sitting at about 25, 26, 27. And that is a weakness for this football team. So even though you've signed your quarterback, I think it's a weakness right now. And I haven't seen anything to prove otherwise. So I have three strengths and I have three weaknesses for this Houston Texans team. Now, here's the problem. And we're about to go to the schedule. So the Texans won the AFC South last season. That's great. But then what comes with that is, congratulations, you now have a more difficult schedule this year. And this is the main reason why I do not believe that the Houston Texans will make the playoffs in 2015. Or, excuse me, 2016. And also this, you know, you're talking about adding a new quarterback, a new running back, two new wide receivers, there's going to be some chemistry issues to start this season. And speaking of starting the season, J.J. Watt is going to be injured to start this season. He's probably going to miss two, three, maybe four games. I think the start of the season will be rough for this football team, but then they'll get going yet again like they did last season, but they won't quite be able to reach the AFC South pinnacle. But I do believe you know, they're going to be second or third in the AFC South. I think the tight 
Titans are by far the worst team in the AFC South. But I just think they're going to have to get some chemistry issues figured out. And the tougher schedule will do them in. Let's look at the schedule. Yet again, you're in the AFC South. And I believe you went 4-2 and two in the AFC South last year. Uh, this year, I think it's going to be 3-3. Three and three. I honestly think you're going to split with every single team in the AFC South, and that includes the Tennessee Titans. And I believe you're a better team than the Tennessee Titans. But I think Week 17, they're a young they're a football team that this week, they're going to give it their all. This is going to be their Super Bowl. They're going to come out. They're going to play really hard, and they're going to sneak up on you, and they're going to win. So I think it's a 3-3 three and three split with every team in the AFC South. You look at the other games. Go up against the NFC North. That is rough, including when you have to go to Green Bay. That's a loss. You host Chicago week one. You know, I'm high on Chicago this year. And without J.J. Watt, with the chemistry issues that I think you guys are going to have, I, I think the Bears might upset you guys. I, I really, really honestly do. You guys go to Minnesota. I think that's tough, and I think that's a loss. You're basically looking at a mirror image team. I mean, they're very similar to your football team, but when it's in Minnesota, that gives you a lot of troubles there. I just don't see you guys winning that game. But then you guys host Detroit. You should beat Detroit. I, I think it could be 1-3 and three against the NFC North. Best case scenario, 2-2. Two and two. You beat Chicago and you beat Detroit, but I don't see any way you go to Green Bay in Minnesota and win those football games. You guys go up against the AFC West, including games where you go to Denver in Week 7. You host San Diego in Week 12. You guys host Kansas City in Week 2. And you guys, where is the Raiders? Oh, yeah, you guys go to the Raiders in Week 11. So the, let's start with the away games. So at Denver and at Oakland, you know, Denver are very similar to you, especially in terms of the quarterback position. I mean, they have Mark Sanchez. You have you know, Brock Osweiler. I mean, that that's almost a wash. I mean, Brock Osweiler is a little bit better, but not that much better. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, they're very similar football teams, and I don't see how you're going to beat Denver. You know, so I have Denver winning that football game. Uh, at Oakland, Oakland's tough. They're good. They're a playoff team. I, I think that's a loss. You guys host San Diego, and you guys host Kansas City. I think you can win both of those. So I say it's 2-2 two and two, uh, right there against the AFC West. And, and by the way, those are tough games, by the way. So don't you sleep on those games. And then you guys have two games against the AFC East champions and against the AFC North champions, and that would be the Cincinnati Bengals and the New England Patriots. These are two tough games at New England and hosting the Bengals. So I'm actually going to say you're going to upset the Bengals. I think it'll be an upset. In week 16, you're going to upset the Bengals, but you'll lose to the Patriots even without Tom Brady. I think they're a better football team than you. I think Jimmy Garoppolo will do enough. And in terms of what they have, game plan, I think they're just going to beat you guys, especially without J.J. Watt. I, I don't see that you guys winning this football game. So with that said, I have them going 7-9. and nine. The Houston Texans going 7-9. and nine. Best case scenario, you know, I think the schedule is tough. In best case, you can... I can actually see you guys maybe pulling even 10 and 6 out of this. I mean, it may, assuming I'm wrong, assuming Brock Osweiler is better than I think he is, and you know, Will Fuller can make a huge impact early, and J.J. Watt can come back, and the defense can be as good as it was last season because the defense was great. I mean, they gave up 6 points like 5 times. I mean, it was ridiculous. They're going to need to play that well yet again. I'm not quite sure they will. But assuming they will, assuming the offense can get flowing, I can see 10 and 6, you know, which is a lot higher than the 7 and 9 I'm projecting. But I think that's the highest it goes. Worst case scenario, 6 and 10. Because the defense, it still won't give up a lot of points. And the offense, especially Lamar Miller, should be good enough to win 6 games at least. So I say best case scenario, 10 and 6. Worst case scenario, 6 and 10. But my prediction will be 7 and 9. Just because of the tough schedule, I think you're going to have some issues with the schedule and chemistry and early on. I, I mean, I, I think it could be... Looking at these first five games, I think it's a two and three start. It could be even one and four if you're if you're not careful and you sleep on Kansas City and Chicago week one and two. So you have to look out. You have to be careful. I think it's a seven or nine season for the Houston Texans. Tell me what you think down below. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to like and most importantly to subscribe to us every single damn day. New video uploaded here on this channel, 7 p.m. Central. 8 o'clock Eastern, you know how I do. Until next time, this has been the MJ Tape on Sports Fan Entertainment, and I'm out. Peace.